So, um, again, welcome everyone. This is the last day of this international conference. We've learned tons of, of new tricks that are going to uh, hopefully uh, help figure what is next uh, in this field and um, make it better. So this is the 2021 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. Our next session is animals, entitled Animals as an Integral Aspect of Public excuse me, of public communications before, during, and after emergencies. Um, Dr. Saskia Van Manen, she's going to be um, speaking to us. She's from Design Network for Emergency Management in the Netherlands. It's a privilege to have Dr. Van Manen present today. Her bio and abstracts are available uh, to read from our website when there are speakers. But before we start, a couple of housekeeping issues. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled. So if you have questions, please use the questions and answer feature. And we will endeavor to answer them at the end. I encourage you to use the hashtag GADMConf for Twitter and other social media. And a short evaluation for those of you who haven't been with us before will be made available when you exit the session. And just as a reminder, the video recording is not available and it will not be until it's edited and uh, released at the GAD Mac Awards in July. So without further delay, the floor is yours, Saskia. Thank you very much, Gerardo. Um, welcome, everybody. It's very strange for me to not be able to see anybody, but I guess in this day and age, we're all used to that. Um, my talk is entitled Animals is an Integral Aspect of Public Communication, and particularly uh, by that we mean before, during, and after an emergency happens. Now, I'm giving this talk on behalf of the Design Network for Emergency Management. Um, my co-founders of this network are Claudine, Klaus, Tinji, and Rodrigo, and we are literally spread all around the world. So I am based just south of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, Claudine is in L.A. Klaus is in Auckland, New Zealand, um, Tinji is in Taiwan, and Rodrigo is in Santiago in Chile. So that was, that's, that's us, that's the design network. And next, I'm gonna introduce you, if my slide will advance, there we go, to Jack. So please say hi to Jack. So Jack, um, first of all, Jack's a she, and Jack's a bearded dragon, as you can see. And she's just over a year old and she's about 45 centimeters in length. That's about 18 inches. Um, she lives in Orange, California um, with my, my colleague Claudine and uh, she's a pet to London, um, Claudine's daughter. So Jack actually lives in this really heavy glass tank um, filled with branches to climb on and, and a lovely warm light above it because she's an exotic. And she greatly enjoys her weekly bath and she likes having an occasional spritz of water on the body. And um, she then goes a very pale color um, because that apparently means that she likes it. And she has a nice diet of fresh vegetables, live worms, and insects. Now in early 2020, uh, December 2020, things weren't so good, looking so good for Jack um, because the so-called bond fire was spreading really rapidly near Claudine's home um, in uh, Orange County, California. And they literally saw, they saw the smoke billowing over the mountains behind their house. They saw an orange glow visible on the uh, horizon. And along with thousands of others, they had to evacuate. And despite Claudine's work in search and rescue and her work as a graphic designer in um, emergency management, working on redesign, redesign of tsunami uh, evacuation maps, as well as fire evacuation maps, Claudine uh, found herself in a state of temporary cognitive paralysis, which is a very common uh, psychological state or, or cognitive phenomena that's treated by, by stress. And she realized all of a sudden that she'd never ever considered Jack in evacuating. So um, this, most of you will probably be familiar with this, is the disaster risk management cycle. And Jack and her human family are finding themselves uh, right now at that little uh, red location marker. And if you're wondering why there's a circle within a circle, it's because the outer circle in this case is representing COVID-19, which is this very long drawn out disaster that we're finding ourselves in, this, this emergency. 
And so the inner circle here is the bonfire in this specific instance. Um, but it could be anything. It could be an earthquake and it could be a tsunami. And so even though this um, diagram shows two circles, that doesn't mean we're just limited to two circles either. Because in California, it wouldn't be strange to have at least a moderate earthquake uh, or potentially a tsunami warning, even if there's no tsunami following that. So if we think about the main goals of emergency management throughout this disaster risk management cycle, they are to prevent the loss of life, they are to ensure prompt assistance, and to contribute to an effective recovery. And throughout all of these phases, throughout this entire circle, what is really key is communication before, during, and after. And good communication really goes a long way towards achieving these goals of emergency management. And this communication has to reach a really wide range of audiences. Now, if we consider what happens in an emergency, um, we see that there's generally three choices. Either people evacuate with their pets in whatever way they can. People will evacuate and leave their pet behind. Um, that also causes additional issues later on, as, as many of you will know, where people will return to areas that are off limits, um, thereby endangering not only themselves, but also rescue workers. And the third option is that people will shelter in place because they don't want to, either they don't want to abandon their pets or they realize that if they evacuate, they have nowhere to go with their pet because so many of the shelters do not accept pets and they do not want to be separated. And the more companion animals there are in a household, the less likely people are to evacuate. So the more likely we are to see them uh, sheltering in place. Um, and actually quite a, a nice famous example of someone refusing to evacuate is um, after the 1980 explosion of Mount St. Helens, there was a 75 year old man that was found uh, alive with four dogs. Um, it, he was uh, within the blast zone of St. Helens and, and he came out alive, but he was, you know, it's, his case is quite rare. Now, poor quality of relaying preparedness and emergency information results to these risks and, or, or contributes to these risks and losses. And just a little side note, the middle picture there of abandoning that was taken by my sister and it's staged. So it's not a real um, picture of a dog being abandoned. So with the risks that we see um, that either leaving animals behind or um, sheltering in place um, bring out, it is not surprising that animals and animal ownership is generally considered a risk factor for uh, evacuation and particularly for early evacuation. Um, however, there is some interesting research out there by Thompson et al. And they actually postulate that you can reconfigure animal attachment um, and animal ownership into a um, protective factor. And this is really flipping, out, flipping around how we've traditionally thought about animals in emergency management. Um, so really, how can we communicate around animals and make it a protective factor? Uh, it opens up new social networks, it opens up new channels, communication channels, and motivational pathways to get people to actually start preparing um, for disasters. So what on earth does design have to do with that? Because I'm talking about communication design. Now FEMA has actually come out and said that design of messages is critical to saving lives. Um, and the nice thing about design is that it's a connective discipline that's characterized by iterative, iterative solution finding, um, and it utilizes creative tools to communicate. And it also underlying that is actually a really clear framework that's entitled design thinking. So one of the things that designers will do first is starting to understand their audience and starting to understand their user needs. And then ideally we work with people to develop um, solutions um, and we call this human-centered design. And empathy is really at the core of that. So being able to imagine or understand what another person is thinking or feeling, walking in their shoes in a way. And when you have a better understanding of your audience, you can better tailor your, men your message. And um, also a really important part of bringing people on board in the whole design process is to bringing this general public on board in the design process is that they're actually more likely to take up the final solution and engage with them. So there's a number of really important overarching elements to effective communication. That's message. Um, so what you're actually saying, the timing when you're saying it, 
the context in which you're saying it, so where it is said or displayed or whatever, um, any visuals that you include, and who the message is intended for and how relevant it is to them. And actually communicating new information to the public during an emergency is the worst time to try and teach them something new. Um, this is a time when, uh, from a cognitive perspective, information really becomes a structural support for them. And so it already needs to be in place or they already need to know where to look for it. So why the focus on visual communication? Because I'm really going to swipe, switch to visual communication now. So the majority of emergency messaging relies on visual infrastructures. And written text is a visual infrastructure. It's a visual presentation of information. And actually, um, we, as humans, perceive visual information so much faster than most other kinds of information. In fact, you could uh, flash up, um, they've done this in marketing studies, you can flash up an, the uh, logo of a tea company, for example, um, so quickly that people won't cognitively, won't actually realize that they've perceived it. They'll say they've not seen it. Um, and yet, when you then ask them to pick a brand of tea in the shop afterwards, they will pick the one that they've seen most often. So we really, this, this visual signal travels so incredibly quickly. And a really important thing about what I've done here, obviously most of us would say that this is pretty terrible visual communication, or at least I hope most of you will say that. Um, and one of the things that's really terrible about this one is actually what I've done to the word communication. It has the same font but I've made it two different colors, and I've made it red and green. And if we think about it, red and green is about 8% of the global male population will have a problem distinguishing the colors that I've used here. And this is something that we really have to think about also when we're communicating in visuals, is um, our use of color, but also the uh, ability and accessibility of what we've produced for our audience. So this really brings me to audience, and we, we, we often talk about this general public, um, but who are they really? Um, because within this term, there's so many abilities, there's diversity, there's different languages, there's different responsibilities, there's different resources, there's so many things to think about. And this is again why we go to human-centered design. And we come with a level of empathy, and we really try and understand our audience at a much deeper level. And if you think about traditional uh, disaggregation of um, the public, it's based on demographic profiles, such as education, income, gender, or ethnicity. And actually design is more concerned with uh, an audience psychographic profile. So what are their aspirations? What are their motivations? What drives them? What are their barriers? And understanding those really allows us to design for them. And also, of course, the accessibility. Again, what are their abilities? And what do we need to think about? For example, not everybody is able to see. Now, how do we reach people like that um, with, or people have poor vision? How do we reach people like that in our emergency communications? So there's a couple basic elements that are really um, core uh, of what a graphic designer or a graphic designer for emergency management can bring. And it's the lines. And you'll see lines in the arrow there. For example, the arrow is a line. And lines are really important because they can show direction and orientation. Then we have shapes, and shapes can also indicate areas, for example. And then we have colors on the top left there. Um, they also communicate different things, but important to remember there is that they communicate different things in different cultures. So be really mindful of that, particularly if you're working outside of your own uh, country, for example, or your own background, your own culture, where you've come from. And the fourth that I'm mentioning here is typography. Now, typography essentially is, is a mixture of lines and shapes, depending on the font you choose. But your font actually has a really big impact on how something is perceived. And if you're more interested in this, I really recommend um, Sarah Hintman's book, uh, Why Fonts Matter. And she also does some really fun online workshops about um, sense or fonts and perception. So check that out. And then there's a couple of design principles, and together um, they help us to form an image or a visual. So there's unity, for example, in this circle here, we can see that all the white stripes belong together. 
And then there's gestalt, which a lot of you will, might have heard about, which means that by arranging something, um, we have an overall design. So here we have a circle in the overall design. And then there's space. And a white space, which can help to reduce visual noise, is really important. And there's some white space that in this case is not white, also in this circle. So it's important to take these components on board. And if you consistently apply some of these basic design elements, you get a bit of a visual standard. And in a way, this is sort of a branding almost of your information. Um, and I think we're all familiar with how big brands around the world use specific logos and colors to make themselves recognizable. Think about Coca-Cola. They have a nice swirly font and they have that typical shade of red. And you can recognize them from a distance, whether you're in the USA or whether you're somewhere in the middle of Africa or they really also managed to go the last mile. Um, so you'll find them anywhere and you'll recognize them anywhere. Now, if you look at this image, the maps on the left, and these were done by my colleague Claudine, um, the maps on the left were evacuation maps uh, before she redid them. Um, and then the ones on the right, they've had a visual standard applied to them. So these are maps from the Tsunami Clear project that she did over in California. So that brings me back to California and it brings me back to Jack. So remember there was the bonfire and they could see the orange glow on the horizon, but Jack uh, had not been thought about. There was no carrier for Jack and this is often an impediment in evacuating a pet. Um, so in the end, Jack had to go in an Amazon box from A to Z, um, apparently also in emergencies and it provided a stand-in. Now the box was not very big. Uh, the box was the size of Jack's body and there were no holes to look out through. Um, they did remember to take a light. Um, there were no branches and it was dried food. So Jack was really unhappy. And actually that meant that Jack turned really a dark color and expressed that she was unhappy in that way. And she actually refused to eat for three weeks. Um, they were able to evacuate safely and they were evacuated for three days before returning to their home. But before Jack really got back to being herself, it took another three weeks. So what can this all tell us about communication and bringing in animals into that disaster communication or emergency preparedness communication and of course also communication during the emergency and afterwards? How can we best do that? So to start uh, looking at that question really was by starting to look at how that is done now. And I looked at Orange County, California to just constrain me. It's in Southern California. California, it's the home of Disneyland. Um, that's what it's most famous for. It's not the largest county in California, as you can see, but it is the second most densely populated. There is no mandatory animal registration there with the exemption of dogs and the exact number of pets living there is unknown. Um, but it is estimated that around two thirds of all Americans are pet owners. Um, so therefore we can assume that it has about 670,000 uh, households with pets. And what I found really was that information and particularly when related to animals is presented in a very haphazard and disconnected manner. Um, it has 34 cities, uh, Orange County incorporated cities and every city does its own thing and does it differently. And the information, so the actual message that they present is different. And uh, in fact, animals are often also overlooked. Uh, and what you can see here is that the information that is provided is very text heavy. And the other thing is that it has a very zoo centric perspective. So there's sort of one checklist for people and there's another checklist for animals. And also the animal checklist is often sort of hidden away as a secondary afterthought or a secondary preparedness list. Um, and that, while well, the majority of the people there will be a pet owner. Um, and the other opposite of uh, the text heavy is that we actually had uh, some of these things that are really image heavy. And you might think, oh, great, you know, now we actually have some visual in there. But what it, mm, mm, I have found in my own research is that people relate really badly to actual photographs of things. It's much better to use icons. And the other thing that I noticed is that there's Ready Fox. So Ready OC, Ready Orange County, to introduce children to disaster preparedness relies on Ready Fox. And Ready Fox is not alone. We all know Smokey Bear, I think, the longest running public education campaign in the US, um, which is very awareness focused rather than action focused. And in other towns, there's Ready Raccoon, or in, in Mississippi, there's Rainy Raccoon. But these are all 
focused on engaging children um, with disaster preparedness and are really used in an illustrative manner rather than being an integral aspect of the message or the communication. And so if I go back to the research that's out there from Thompson et al, she, she really um, emphasizes on looking at the human animal. So really that connection that humans have with their animals and using that. So talking to people no longer as a person with a cat, for example, but a cat owner. Um, and actually one campaign that did that really well is the Who Depends on You campaign, which ran in Washington State, I think around 2010. And that campaign really made people aware of, oh yeah, hang on, who depends on me? And, and in their visuals, they actually showed some dogs and I think also some cats. And so that really made people realize, okay, these animals depend on me for their survival. And that's actually one example that I've managed to find that worked really well. So if we take all of the theory that I just tried to condense into these slides uh, and we apply it, um, we get, to this demo that I've prepared for you. Um, oh, sorry, uh, let me try and switch to the demo. Let's see. Can everybody, Gerardo, can you tell me whether you can see this demo now? Can you see the uh, sort of website? I, yeah, I see what, uh, yeah, a dog in a hand. It says we yeah. help you, blah, blah. Yeah, make your plan. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm just going to run you through this. And this is sort of a website um, prototype. Uh, it's a very early prototype. It's not been tested. Um, so please don't just copy and paste any ideas from this. Um, but talk to me, have a chat. Um, and the idea is, OK, if you, you can make this website and you can sign up. And you ask people to create a personal account. And then you can ask them to provide a little bit of information about the household. And for example, do you have any pets to take care of? It's the bottom question there. And in the interest of time and wanting to answer questions, I'm going to run through this a little bit quickly. So you can also ask people about disabilities, about medication, uh, their emergency contacts, their family doctor. You can gather all of this information so that it's later on it's in one place for them to go uh, and, and rediscover. And you can, of course, also ask them about their furry friend. And by integrating them into this process of starting to think about, you know, what it is that you um, have to do to prepare yourself, you are already making them an integral aspect of the communication right there. And then you can ask about more of the basics. Um, so the breed, the age, uh, a microchip if they have one. Uh, is, is in this case, if it's a dog, is it spayed or neutered? Um, upload a photo. Is there any other information that might be relevant? And then, you know, once you've collected all of this information, you can then send them on to a dashboard. And this dashboard is based around the three main concepts that are repeated throughout the world of what you need to do to prepare for a disaster, which is you need to have your emergency kit, you need to have an emergency plan, and you need to stay informed. So you need to know what might be coming your way and when it does, what happens and how you stay up to date. So um, this is just a really quick overview. Say, for example, talking about Southern California, some of the hazards might be wildfires, earthquakes, tsunamis. And these progress bars will show you how far you are in your personal preparedness process. So for example, if I entered all of the information for my dog, um, this would come out. I would have a little, um, a little card in a way for my dog that provides me with some core information and actually also a QR code that's generated from that information. And that QR code might be used, uh, for example, by shelters, if the emergency uh, animal shelters, if they want to scan information and work more rapidly than just using paper sheets. They would just be a matter of scanning and then they've got all this core data about the animal. And if, for example, we want to look at the emergency kit, uh, here we see, you know, a little explanation of why and what to include, but in the essentials, it mixes the human and the dog's essentials. Um, and again, in the other categories, so shelter and safety, uh, for example, there is a collar and there is a lead for the dog. And entertainment, there's toys for the dog. And um, if it does happen to be emergency, you can, get, of course, log into this 
and actually your dashboard would look totally different. It would make it very clear to you um, via colors and symbols and, and even you could add sounds to that. Um, uh, to make it clear that there is a warning. So for example, here I've done it's a warning and you are under a voluntary evacuation order. So it gives you very clear steps of what to do. And that is actually to deal with that phenomena that Claudine struggled with, which is this cognitive paralysis where you're like, okay, I don't know what to do now because I feel so overwhelmed. So it's really trying to address that. And then immediately gives you sort of locations for you that you could potentially go um, that you've obviously entered before and also for the dog where you could potentially, if you can't take the dog with you in this case, where you could bring the dog. So that's just that little checklist. Um, back to my presentation. It was just a very quick demo. I'd love to hear your feedback and any comments on that um, after the talk. Back to Jack. Uh, I'm happy to say that Jack is safe and sound. After her three weeks uh, of not eating, she finally um, had was given live crickets, hand-fed very gently, very delicately by London, um, and she started to eat again. And she then finally accepted having a bath, and she turned from her dark shades back to her light shades. And now Jack has her own emergency go bag. Uh, and a large portable tank that she can go into uh, when they do have to evacuate. Unfortunately, this is um, learning by error and by trial. And this is, of course, what we want to prevent. And this is why it's so important to include animals early on in, in, in our communications and in any of the outreach that um, we do from emergency management. So takeaway points, if I really have to put some for this presentation, and I really tried to condense a lot of theory into a very short time, um, is include animals in your communication. Really think about that. Um, and it's not just about pets either. It's also about um, livestock, for example, um, but service animals. They might be welcome in places, but they also still have their own needs as, as service animals. And get to know your audience. Know who you're talking to. Know what's important to them. Know what motivates them and know what holds them back. Um, and that's probably the most important point here. And then another one is enlist designers because they have a very different take on information and how to present information to an audience as well as having very specific tools to get to know that audience. And I know that a lot of emergency managers out there will go, oh, I don't have the budget for that. Um, then talk to your local university, talk to your local college. There will be students there that are interested uh, in doing a project, in helping you out, or come and talk to us at the Design Network for Emergency Management. Uh, most of us are affiliated with the university, and we have students um, that would love to do projects. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you, Saskia. Your uh, storytelling skills speak for themselves. And um, I heard you the other way when you said uh, include animals in communications. I heard include communications every time you talk about animals. Um, <laughs> there you go. I have a few questions already. <clears throat> the first one is, is it envisioned that this plan is printable and portable in hard copy as well? Totally. So um, what I didn't say there is that print um, is it's really easy for us in the digital age to start going to, oh, let's make a website, oh, let's make an app. But there's something about having information in print that's a much more direct confrontation with this information. And it also adds a tactile, a sensory experience to that that we don't have if we're just looking at it on the screen. And that tactile sensory experience also helps us remember that information. So the ability to have it in print is really important. Um, so one of the things I did include in the demo for that list, for example, of, of your emergency preparedness kit is there is a big print button, button on the bottom. Uh, so you could easily print it out. And it's also something that could be more generically printed, for example, to have at a vet's. So you could have a more generic list for what you need for a dog or a cat or a, a reptile um, and have a vet hand it out. Great. <clears throat> the next question is, are animal fosters or guardians included? And in brackets, it says, there are hundreds of rescue organizations in California that place animals with homes. They, um, so this is just a prototype. So it's not a live working um, website, uh, or at least not at this point in time, it could become one. 
Uh, and at that point, there would be uh, fosters included and there would also be um, more of a link towards, hey, I, maybe you found an animal and you can also report it to a database. Great. Next question is, is there or will there be a phone app available so individuals can pull up their plans and other information if they are away from home or have lost their power slash internet access? That would definitely be the idea. So the idea would be that it is that this information, if you decide to store it in, in, in the cloud, as it were, is accessible in multiple ways and definitely via an app because these day, this day and age, we are almost likely to have our phone with us at any given point in time. And if that is immediately where all of our information is, for example, also a copy of your ID, a copy of your pet's vaccination records, copy of your insurance information, then you've got it all right there. That's the idea. There is uh, someone here that agrees with me. I've been looking for someone to work on an outreach piece for reptile evacuation preparedness. Would love to connect with Jack, an owner. Super presentation. Thank you. And um, just send me an email and I'm happy to put you in touch. Great. Another one. Whoa, love this and would love to play some more with your app and website if possible. Happy to road test it and provide feedback. When finished, will this be available to all for us or just your local audience? It is not currently out there on the web because it is really just a first prototype and something that the design network and I are very passionate about is that we want to test whatever it is that we put out there. So if there are people out there that are saying, hey, we'd love to test this and maybe you, you uh, are, work for an organization and have a bigger audience even that we could test it with to get more feedback, that would be great. Well, now that you've made it public, Saskia, you know, chop, chop, money, <laughs> money. The next question. <laughs> It's not about the money. <laughs> it's about <laughs> it's about making the impact. Another question. Thanks for a great presentation, Saskia. The prototype tool looks brilliant. I would it would be really great if emergency services in new uh, in New South Wales, Australia, could adopt it. How soon could it be used? You see, um, <laughs> in I was under voluntarily voluntary evacuation in the 2020 fires in Australia. They, they got to within one kilometer of my house. The mushroom cloud was above us and I couldn't think about my safety or what I should take until I had everything, I had everything my pets needed. Having this website would have made my, me better prepared and less stressed. Come wow, on. that's, sounds like it was a really, really scary situation. Uh, thank you for sharing that, whoever it was that shared it, because I can't see that. Um, thank you for sharing your experience there and um, your question about when this might be live. Uh, it would be a matter of how much funding uh, we could put into it because essentially the concept is there. Uh, it would really be the developing uh, where it, that would still take the time and the money. Okay. <clears throat> I'm feeling a little bit of our work here with so many questions. Next one is, do you offer online training? Do we offer it? Actually, that is something that we are currently developing. Um, so please uh, head over to our website, um, dnem.org, um, and sign up for our mailing list, and then you will hear about it as soon as it goes live. And the training right. will be really focused around the different design aspects, um, and it will be given uh, by all five of, of the team. So you'll get a really international perspective. Cool. How does the website work from the emergency response point or view and the considerations of data sharing? In terms of emergency response, that is uh, an avenue that I have not pursued very uh, much yet in this, but the idea would really be that they could interact more with the, uh, it would really be more about the animal response and it'd be really looking more at how we can work with animal uh, shelters, emergency shelters and uh, emergency rescues in that point. And it's something that I would love to dive into further. So if anybody wants to talk to me about that, I would love it. Great. Next, wonderful database. I can't speak to its effic efficiency, uh, but there is a colorblind web page filter, TopTal, to see if your color choices are accessible to most users. Are there are there other such tools that you can recommend? 
Yes, there is actually an app called Via Opta. Um, I think it's one of the big pharmaceutical companies that's put it out there. But Via Opta is a great little app, and it allows you to simulate uh, different optical impairments. So that's one that I would really recommend. Okay, here's another. How and when do you estimate emergency services could start using your service? <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we have enough money to, to really put it out there live, um, it'd be, it's the time and money. I mean, if we would um, have the budget and the manpower, it would be, I, I imagine we could have it live by the end of the year, if not sooner. You shouldn't be talking to us. You should be working. Another one. This <laughs> thing, messaging, messaging and visuals is one of our area's struggles uh, with emergency messaging. The website is great. Would, uh, would the website be something that the website is adopted by a city or a state or just for individuals? You could definitely um, have a city or a state adopted and branded to their own uh, sort of city or, or state or county uh, branding. Um, but the idea would still be as much as possible that you uh, create a certain visual standard. And so you could pop your own logo on there, for example, but the idea would be that we keep the fonts the same across every single version for every single city in the area. So that if you were you to move the next town over, you don't have to use to learn a whole new navigation layout in this website or this app. Um, so that you already know what to expect. Um, it's really on, on that user experience for that. Another one, this is very promising. Uh, will this be applicable to farms with livestock? I think that the version that I just showed you is not that applicable to farms with livestock. Having said that, that certainly doesn't mean that we can't develop a version that is. And all that would really take is a number of tick boxes. There, there's a certain conditional logic in, in, in this. Um, so this is me going into a little bit technical, um, but there's conditional logic in there. And so if at some point you say, you know, I actually also have livestock, that means it would open up a whole new avenue of, of um, screens that you would go through in terms of what your plan is for this livestock and how you, and how you think you're gonna deal with that. And to make people aware of that and run them through the process. It's really, designed to assist people. And this first um, prototype that I just put out there is really more uh, geared towards pet owners. Okay. Many counties in the US use the smart 911 system. Oh. How does this compare to that system? Totally different system. It um, <laughs> has a totally different function. So this is really geared towards um, Obviously, we want to be able to uh, provide information um, during an emergency, but this is really looking at can we get people activated and motivated to prepare beforehand because we know that preparation saves lives and it saves money. Okay, next one. When I teach disaster planning for pets, a huge part is stressing that people practice and revise their plans on a regular basis. Are there plans to include this, maybe with reminders, within your platform? Yes. So particularly if, if you, uh, you can do that in two ways. If you keep it on a website, you can um, set up automated email reminders or with an app, you can also pop up uh, reminders. For example, go through your emergency kit or revise your plan. Or is this still up to date? Um, and so these are very easy to integrate. Right. Uh, great presentation in implementing the app. Will the impact of national and international privacy legislation be considered or a factor? Uh, I'm in Europe and so we have very strict data protection rules here and so that's um, definite consideration. Okay and uh, not even a choice. <laughs> the last one uh, so far what is your advice to dove dovetail into simultaneous media coverage? Simultaneous, oh this is a bit of an, an open-ended question simultaneous media coverage on what can, can the person that asked that question specify, specify it a bit further? Okay, Linda, uh, please specify a bit. And here it goes. Sorry, during the actual emergency. So what is your advice to dovetail into simultaneous media coverage during the actual emergency? So during the actual emergency, the idea would be that you are um, by some of the co media coverage, but also by some of the, the maybe the posts that are shared on, on social media, that you are reminded of, hey, 
you have this app or you have this website, you have this all filled out and really di direct you back to your own information. Great. Well, Open this is the longest numbers of questions. Uh, any, did I hear a voice or is it my conscience? <laughs> Smell. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's no one more. Have you considered an option for boarding adjustment? I don't know what that means. Adjustment business with database relationship options between owners and business. No, I have not, but that might be a very interesting uh, option to pursue. Thank you for the suggestion. Whoever suggested it. It's anonymous. <laughs> Great. That is, uh, I think that is uh, plenty Saskia. You obviously, Great pushed a lot of buttons. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank it was you. a pleasure to, um, to facilitate this. Um, you guys should know that the next uh, audience is going to be entitled Large Animal Rescue and Livestock Emergency Response Training and Best Practices in just uh, under three, uh, two hours. Thank you uh, again, Saskia, and thanks a lot to the great audience uh, for being here.